We are studying in uh, the Gospel of John in chapter 14. So let's read. Once again, beginning at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. But Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name. I will do it. As we've said before, this is a exceedingly powerful uh, section of scripture. It takes place in the upper room. It is just hours before the cross. And the Lord speaks to his disciples to comfort and to encourage and to instruct them because he's leaving. He is going to go to the cross and they are going to go into the world with the gospel. But in the state they're in right now, things don't look real promising. Their focus is on the fact that the one they have counted on, the one they have followed, the one they've depended on, is not going to be with them any longer. And what are they going to do? And so Jesus proceeds to explain it to them, to comfort them, and to encourage them, and to instruct them. And he says, Don't be troubled because I'm God. You believe in God, believe also in me. And don't be troubled because although I'm leaving you, and that's true, I am not going to be gone for an indefinite time. We will be separated, but only for a short while. And when I go, I'm going to be making a place ready for you. It's a place in my Father's house. It's a place in heaven and because there's a place in heaven because I've gone I will come back for you and I will receive you to myself that you may be where I am also and then Thomas in response to the to Jesus statement that he is the way so, or that, that he that they know where he is going Thomas says lord in verse 5 we don't know where you're going and how can we know the way it's a very practical very pragmatic very humanly understandable statement on Thomas's part or question and Jesus answered it with this really profound answer which we spent some time on last week Jesus says Thomas, you don't need to have instructions on how to get there. You don't need a road map. You only need me because I am the way. I am the way. I am the way to heaven. I am the way to the Father. I'm where, the way to the Father's home and I'm the way to the place where I have prepared for you. I am the way. It is fascinating to me. Go with me to Acts chapter 9 for a moment. Acts chapter 9. And verse 2. Let's start in verse 1. 
And then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way. Go with me to Acts chapter 19. And verse 9. But some were hardened and did not, but but when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way. And in verse 23, and about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. The, The church initially was called the way before people were called Christians. They were called people of the way. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Because their proclamation was, we have found the way. It is him. It is the Messiah. He is the way and he is the only way. So Christians became known as people of the way before they became known as Christians or little Christ which is a better designation than the way but it is fascinating that that particular designation that the Lord placed on himself became the way that the world viewed uh, Christians for some time in the early days of the church he says I am the way and then he says I am the truth that is I'm telling you that I'm the way I'm going to take you there and then I'm telling you the truth about the fact that I'm going to take you there. (laughs) Because I am the truth. I just don't speak truth. I am truth. I define truth. Truth is me. Truth is what I say. And then he says, I am the life. That is, in order for you to come to this place, in order for you to come to the Father's house, in order for you to come to the place I've prepared for you, you have to pass through death. And if you're going to pass through death, you have to come out alive on the other side. And I want you to know that I am life. I am the source of it. So my promise to you that I'm preparing a place for you and I will come and receive you and take you there is absolutely assured by the reality that I do not lie to you and I possess the life you need to get there. That should be encouraging. It should encourage them. It should encourage us. In verse 7 he says, If you had known me, you would have known... Oh, excuse me. Um, no, yeah, If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Um, in verse 8 Philip says... Lord, show us the Father. Now Thomas, Thomas says we don't know the way and the Lord answers it and Thomas, he doesn't talk anymore. He's probably satisfied. But Philip's not satisfied yet. (laughs) So Philip asks the next question. Lord, that's good. That's good. I hear you. Now if you'll just show us something. That's pretty strange, isn't it? Just show us the Father. And it'll be sufficient for us. Is that all? Is that all you want? Look, what is Philip asking for? Well, he's probably asking, much like the the Jewish people and the leaders have asked over and over, give me a sign, give me something that's tangible that I can see. He's asking for, uh, in theological terms, a theophany. A theophany is that that um, that time in in history and within the Word of God, where God um, makes Himself manifest in various physical ways. So um, uh, we we would see it in Exodus in chapter 33, where where the Lord spoke to Moses, and Moses said, "Let me see your glory." And the Lord said, "You can't look on me in full, but I'll put you in the rock and pass by you, and you can you can see me pass by as I." tell you who I am. Or it could be Isaiah, you know, chapter 1, verse 6, where Isaiah is taken into heaven and sees the 
this um, amazing vision of the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Or maybe it's Ezekiel and that amazing vision that Ezekiel saw of the Lord. But what what uh, Philip is asking for is uh, something more than the Lord's uh, promise. And I really think that um, saddens the Lord. I think, I think his response to Philip shows a a certain amount of lament, of concern, of, um, I, I won't call it discouragement, because he is the Lord, but there's, there's something in his voice that kind of sounds like, are you kidding? <laughs> you know, come on, guys. Well, l- let's read it and see what you think. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Ah, Philip. Haven't you, haven't you listened to me? Haven't you looked at me, watched me, observed me? Haven't you... Haven't you had all of the evidence that you need to realize that I and the Father are one? This is the the very theme of the Gospel of John. The very theme of the Gospel of John is that Jesus Christ is fully deity, second person of the Trinity, one in the Trinity. He is God of very gods. He is the Almighty. It started in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him, and apart from Him nothing was made. He is God. He is God incarnate. It is the Word that has been made flesh. In, in John 5, he says, uh, before Abraham, in, excuse me, in John 10, 58, before Abraham was, I am in John 10:30, he says something that shows this is the claim he has made all the way through his ministry. In John 10:30, he says, "I and the Father are one. One in essence. One in nature." And and the Jewish people around him knew exactly what he was saying because they took up stones. To kill him. And Jesus said, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? And they said this, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. You see. So the theme of John's Gospel, all the way through is the reality that Jesus Christ is God. That is from the beginning of the announcement of His birth all the way through to His resurrection and ascension. And it centers around His claims, His I Am claims. It centers around His miracles and around His words. But here are the guys that should know Him best. And they're asking for more. They still are looking for more. Jesus says, um, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Verse 10. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. For the Father who dwells in me does the works. Uh, Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. For most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do. What what is Jesus saying? He's saying, look, uh, uh, Philip, look at the words that I've spoken. Do, Do you remember what I have said? And do you remember what... I have done. Those are the evidence that I am in the Father. And what he says is, 
that's the evidence that you can see to convince you that what you're looking at is God incarnate. If you want to know what the Father is like, Jesus is saying, you just need to look at me. When you think about that, that's one of the more astounding claims in Scripture. And yet it's true, isn't it? I mean, if you want to know what the Father is like, you look at Jesus. What is Jesus like? What is he like? I mean, if you ask yourself that question, what is Jesus like? What would you think? What are some of the things you would think of? Perfection? Holiness? Without sin? He's merciful? Compassionate? I mean, that's what you see. What you, when you don't see a God that, that is vindictive. You don't see a God that is continually angry with people, that is, um, that is unapproachable, that has no concern about the issues of life and the things that we as humans face. What you see is a God who is kind and merciful and gracious and compassionate. And, and I hope what you can do is I hope you can, you can file back through the New Testament accounts and you can remember all of the encounters that Jesus has with people all the way through those gospel accounts because that's what you should be learning about Jesus, that that's who he is. He is always available. He is always loving. He is forgiving. And at the same time, he has power that only God has. And he has sovereignty over the seen world and the unseen world that only God has. And he accepts worship that only God accepts. And at the same time, he hates sin. He hates sin and he promises that sinners will be judged if they reject the provision that he offers. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to know what the eternal, almighty God, creator of the universe is like, you simply need to look at Jesus. Now, you need to look at him on the pages of Scripture, not in the imaginations of your mind, which unfortunately too many people do. But there is plenty of information in the Word of God about our magnificent Savior who is our perfect and holy uh, God. And that's what he is saying to Philip. The, the two evidences that he offers are his words. His words. <clears throat> what, what happens when Jesus speaks? Um, well, go with me to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, <clears throat> after the Sermon on the Mount. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished. They were astonished at his teaching. Why? Well, because of the wisdom contained in his words. Because of the authority with which he spoke them. He spoke them as one who wrote them. <laughs> he didn't speak from Jewish tradition he didn't speak from the authority of others. He spoke from the authority of God and being God. And they were astonished. Uh, go with me to John uh, chapter 7. John 7, verse 46.
Oh, we're starting at 45. Then when the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said to him, Why have you not brought him? And the officers, as would be his enemies, right? Set, set to get him and bring them back to the Pharisees. They said, no man ever spoke like this man. He, his enemies were in awe of him. Because of his wisdom. And because of his authority. And because he spoke truth like they had never heard before. And when Jesus spoke in John chapter 11 and verse 43, and now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead rose up. Jesus' words are the words of God. In fact, he says he speaks only the words of the Father. He comes to do the will of the Father. He is on the plan of the Father. He has the power of the Spirit. And he says what God the Father has told him to say. He speaks with his authority. And when he speaks, it's like no one has ever spoken. The Word of God is unlike any other religious book anywhere. It claims to be the very words of God and it proves it's the very words of God by its accuracy, by its authority, and by the wonder of the truth contained in it. It is timeless in its wisdom. It is never obsoleted. It does not lack anything that we need for life and godliness. It is the words of the eternal God. And that's all Jesus says is, look, if looking at me, being with me, isn't enough, would you please just listen to what I've said? Would you please just contemplate on my words? And I would say that's the lesson for us, too. Even though we know him, I think sometimes we forget just how awesome he is, just how kind he is, just how compassionate he is. And we need to look again at his words and, uh, and appropriate them to our own lives because it's based upon those words that we then can live by faith in trusting him through all of the issues of life and in the promise that he has a place for us when this life is through. Well, if it isn't the words that's enough evidence for you, Philip, or for whoever the skeptic is, then Jesus says, uh, look at my works. Now, that's the same call that he has made. We don't have time to look at it. But he's made this same call in 1025, 1032, 1037, 1038 of John as he has told people that are with him, the Jews and the crowds, over and over and over again, don't just believe me by what I say, but evaluate that based upon what I do by my works. Because... I only do things that God can do. I, I do things that are miraculous. I, I heal people who are incurable. I heal lepers. I raise the dead. I create food and feed Thousands. I walk on water. I forgive sins. Come on. <laughs> Why would you not believe me, is what he's saying. Why would you not believe me? 
My words give testimony of who I am. My works give testimony of who I am. And beyond those, you have the testimony of yourself, you guys. I mean, you were there on the Mount of Transfiguration. You saw me. <laughs> You've heard John the Baptist. He was the witness. You've seen his, his proclamation of me and his tying that proclamation to Old Testament prophecy so that as the scripture that witnesses of me, it is he that witnesses of me, you should witness of me because my words and my works prove that I am who I claim to be and therefore you should take comfort in what I tell you because it's all going to be fine. And that's just the beginning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time today in your word. Thank you, Jesus, for being who you are, that we can be continually reminded of your deity. And in that, we can see the magnificence of your person, your goodness and your kindness and your mercy, your grace, your compassion, your love, your forgiveness, all of who you are, that we too might trust you fully, Lord, for all the issues of our life, as we trust you for eternity and we anticipate your soon return. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.